Um, well, welcome everyone. This is such a pleasure, pleasure to host you all tonight um, for our February book, book club event. I know many of you know me, but in case you don't, my name is Stephanie Steinberg. I am the founder of the Detroit Writing Room and also the New York Writing Room, which is now our virtual sister chapter in New York City. Um, I'm really, really excited to have Rochelle Riley here tonight as our featured book talk guest. And thank you, uh, Wayne State Press, for supporting this event tonight, as well as Desiree Cooper's book talk, which will be in April. Um, and with that, I am very excited to introduce uh, Rochelle Riley. She is a longtime um, columnist for the Detroit Free Press, who I read for many, many years, um, and I had the pleasure of meeting as well once I was back in Detroit, but um, now she is the director of the city's uh, arts and cultures department, if that's correct. Um, and we are in for a treat tonight. So I'm not gonna take up any more time. I am going to transfer the Zoom over to Rochelle. And if you guys have questions, save them till the end. We will have Q&A around 7.30, 7.40. So Rochelle, the Zoom is all yours. Thank you so, so much. I am thrilled to be here. I love the Detroit Writing Room. I love any room where writing is going on. Um, I am a writer by trade, warrior by necessity. So that's what I did with my column for almost 20 years. And that's what I do now. Once a writer, always a writer. Once a journalist, you can't turn it off. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me. And then I want to talk about the book. I arrived in Detroit um, in September of uh, 2000. Uh, my anniversary was on 9-11, which means I never celebrated my anniversary. And um, I was supposed to be here about two years on my way to Los Angeles to make films. And as you can see, I never left because I love Detroit. It gets under your skin, it gets into your heart. And, you know, I was so thrilled to be a part of what has been happening here. Um, some of it, you know, with my column. So I was thrilled about that. Um, I always wanted to write books, but I was doing the thing that I loved. I wanted to be a writer and a journalist since I was a kid, and that's all I ever wanted to do, which means when it was time to go to college, I applied to one school, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, because they have the best journalism program in the country. I hope there's no Northwestern grads here. <laughs> and um, I immediately started being a reporter and then an editor and then a columnist, and every single job was one that came to me through the universe. And every single time I changed jobs, it was amazing. But I do wanna tell you how I became a columnist because that's when I began writing full time. I was on my way to being a publisher. There aren't a lot of black women who are editors and publishers of newspapers. So there was a lot riding on me by a lot of other people besides me. And I was at a Gannett newspaper, the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky, and going back and forth you know, to Gannett headquarters, the Death Star in Virginia. And oh, did I say that out loud? Anyway, so um, we were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And every time I left, my daughter's nanny would move into our house and take care of her while I was gone. And then I would call in every night and sing her Moon River so she could go to sleep. Well, we had a night meeting. And so I called and said, I got to talk to her early. I got to talk to her now because I'm not going to be able to talk to her later. What are you guys doing? And she said, oh, my God, I have to tell you what happened. And I said, what happened? Do I need to come back? Something bad happened? She said, oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean to alarm you, it's just I wanted to tell you about what happened. I uh, decided to surprise her and I made a burger and fries for dinner and I put it on the table and her eyes got real big and she said, I didn't know you could get this at home. So the next day I quit. But the editor said, I'm not gonna let you quit. What, what's the problem? And I said, my daughter didn't know I could make a hamburger. I missed the world's largest Sunday. I'm not raising her, her nanny is. I'm not doing this anymore. He said, what do you wanna do? I will never be able to tell anyone in my whole life why I said this, but I said, I want to be a columnist, and he let me. And from that moment forward, being a better mom led to me having the best job I ever had, and I've been writing ever since. So my first book was The Burden, and it's called The Burden, African Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery. And I wrote that because uh, there's still this belief by some folks, as was espoused by this Pittsburgh columnist, that slavery was not something we needed to keep talking about. Black people needed to get over it. You know, this was in the past. And that let me know two things. One, he didn't know any black people. And two, oh, and he also said, uh, black people are better off than had they stayed in Africa, which of course also meant he'd never been to Africa. So um, I wrote a Facebook post because, you know, you can't write a column attacking another columnist. I mean, you know, First Amendment, you can say what you want, even if it's wrong. 
But I wrote this Facebook post and it was, oh my God, the response was so amazing till I said, okay, there's something here. Maybe we can just find a way to put this myth to bed for good. So I decided to create a chorus of voices and I started calling people. I called up uh, Leonard Pitts, my friend who's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Miami Herald. He was finishing his book and I said, I I'm doing this book on this. He said, okay, I'm in. And he stopped what he was doing to write something. I called my friend, Nicole Hannah Jones, and I said, I know you're working on a book, but I'm doing this. And she stopped what she was doing to write the forward. And I made those calls over and over and I got all of those essays in. And this is what was telling. Not one of the essays in that book about the burden that African-Americans bear was on the same subject. Every single one was about a different way that it affects life uh, adversely. So when I finished that book, and thanks to Wayne State University Press, it just came out in paperback and is selling just like it did in 2018. Um, I started to think about what I wanted to do next. And I realized that what I wanted to do was what I've been talking about doing for about 12 years. And that's trying to figure out how to change the public schools to teach a full history, to teach all of American history, because we are one America, one history. And while I was trying to figure all of that out, and while I was finishing The Burden, this was in 2018, and The Burden had just come out that February, and for the second February in a row, I saw these pictures on um, Facebook and on Twitter, amazing photos of this little girl, she was four and then five years old, um, as famous African-American women. And I mean, it wasn't just dress up, and she was wearing, you know, Katherine Johnson's glasses or wearing somebody's hair. She embodied them. You could see it in her eyes and her demeanor, and I was like, oh, I have to find out who this woman is. So I went to Facebook and I tracked her down and called Christy Smith Jones out of the blue. And I said, you know what? I love what you're doing with these photographs. Would you talk to me? And what was stunning is that she knew who I was. And she said, oh my God, I can't believe you're calling me. And I went, oh no, no, no. This is not that kind of call. I'm, I'm literally calling because your pictures are gorgeous. I think that these pictures are worth a thousand words each. And, and I would like to write biographical, inspirational essays to go with them. And she said, oh no, we can't do something like that. These are just photographs of my kid. And I said, oh no, 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 these photographs are important. She just wasn't really understanding that how I could want to do anything with her pictures. So I got on a plane and I flew to Seattle and I rented a car and I drove to Kent and I met her at her house and I took her family to lunch and I spent an afternoon convincing her to let me use the photos. And she finally agreed. And I got so excited and I said, when we finish this book, we're going to do one on scientists and we'll do one on business people and we'll do one on music icons and girls can dress as Beyonce. And she said, we're not doing any of that. I'm only doing one book. And she's very, very shy, which is why she's not doing any of this book tour with me. I'm trying to convince her to change her mind and do one, but she said, absolutely not. Um, I mean, shy to the point of like really shy, but she's so beautiful in her explanation of why she did it. Her daughter came home, little Lola came home from uh, her class and talked to her about Martin Luther King and what she learned about him and how important he was. And she said, this is, she's a little sponge. She gets all of that. If she's getting it, I need to be teaching it. And that's why she started to do that. So we were stuck with, I could only do one book with her. And we had these beautiful photographs of these women. And I said, well, if we're only doing one book, we can't leave out little boys. They have to be inspired too. So we, we, we've got to do, would you at least do that? And we shoot some photographs of a little boy and pick some icons for him. And she said, well, we have to find a little boy. And I said, ah, I've got a little boy. So I flew to Dallas and I got my grandson, Caleb. And in a four day weekend between uh, bouts of Fortnite and cupcakes, she managed to get him to do the same thing that Lola did. And when we saw the pictures and saw how it wasn't just playing dress up, it was understanding who these grown-ups were and what they grew to be. And that was exactly what we hoped. The whole point of the book was to make sure that every child knows that every important adult, every famous adult was once a child. No matter where you start, there's that moment that can change your life. So what I'd like to do is to read you, because the way I decided to write these was to start each of these essays with that moment and that child life. So. I'm going to share the screen so that you can meet some of these. And if you wanna see all of them, you'll have to get the book. But we're gonna start with Muhammad Ali, who I knew personally and adored because I covered him when I was in Louisville, Kentucky. And as a matter of fact, I got to come to Michigan to Berrien Springs where he was, you know, where he had the farm with the training camp and where he taught me how to box. But anyway, 
Muhammad Ali would grow up to be one of the greatest athletes in history, a man admired for his fight for political freedom as much as for his boxing. But before he was known as the greatest, he was a 12-year-old boy named Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, and he was the victim of a crime. Someone stole his bicycle. That was October 1954. He decided at that point that he was going to find whoever took his bike and whoop him. That was his, you know, that was his goal. And somebody said, you better go over to that gym in the basement of that building and, and let that guy help you. And it was a retired police officer running a boxing gym. And he told him what happened. He said, if you're going to beat somebody up, you better learn how to fight. From that moment, he was a boxer. All through high school, he trained day and night. And with, literally within six years in October of 1960, he won the gold medal at the Olympics in Rome. And as we all know, he became world heavyweight champ three times, but he became this amazing world icon for, you know, believing in yourself and who you are and what you do. So his story is in there. And then I also love this story, Bessie Coleman. She's a favorite for me because never let a man tell you that you can't do something. I, I think that that's one of the things that we have to remember not to let happen. And it's not mansplaining so much as man not understanding the power of women. Bessie Coleman would grow up to become the first and most famous African-American aviator in history. Known as Brave Bessie, she would perform in stunt shows across the country and urge African-Americans to fly. But when she was 11, Bessie worked in the cotton fields with her family and was being raised by a single mother. She had to fight her way out of poverty and she wound up moving to Chicago where her brothers had already forged ahead and sort of became a, forged a trail for the family to follow. And she was in a barbershop with her brothers one day and she read about these French women who were flying. She said, I'm gonna fly an airplane and her brother said, women don't fly. He never should have said that. Bessie went to France, she got her aviator's license and she came back and became one of the best aviation pilots ever. Um, you'll have to read the rest of her story in the book, but um, she literally paved the way for female aviators and some men from that point forward. I'm going to go now to Jackie Robinson, and this was one of the surprises. As people talk to me about the research for the book, and they always ask, was there anything that you discovered that you didn't know? And I, I knew a lot about these folks, but I created a whole library where I got all the different books about each of these people so I could read things and find something I didn't know. There was something about Jackie Robinson that I didn't know. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson would grow up to be the first African-American to play Major League Baseball in the modern era. But when Jackie was a 16-year-old high school student, he was a member of a gang. I never knew that. In all of the coverage, all of the stuff I'd written, all of the stuff I'd read, I just never knew that and I thought, what if there's some 16 year old kid who's being forced into a gang who thinks I have no other life for me, but he reads this story and knows that Jackie Robinson faced that same point in his life and look at what happened with him. So those are the types of things that I am hoping that kids and their parents and their grandparents and their teachers and their librarians will take from this. So no matter where you are, whether you're Shirley Chisholm whose family was so poor, they sent her to live in another country when she was a child, or Katherine Johnson, who helped send men to the moon, but she had to, she and her family had to move uh, from the town where they were because there was no schooling past eighth grade for African American kids. The decisions that were made, the paths that were chosen, some of the things that happened for each of these people made them the folks that they are. So I was really, really thrilled to find those moments and hopefully to inspire kids. And my goal is to change the curriculum in public schools so that all children learn that African-Americans are not just descendants of the enslaved and that for African-American children, that they know that you can be anything you want, even president of the United States. So I have one last one. Um, <coughs> Rosa Parks. This was the first one that I saw that Black History Month when I discovered the pictures and I just literally was mesmerized. And it wasn't just that she found the suit and the hair bow and did her hair the same way and found the exact same glasses and made a sign with the exact right font. Look at the, the, the look in Lola's eyes. 
her mom told her about what this woman did, and she wasn't the only woman to do it. There were civil rights activists who were women who were doing this all the time. And I'm going to read you a couple of uh, pieces about that. But I looked at her face and I thought, this is something that every child should see. And that story is something that every little girl should know. So I just want to read you a little bit of that. But then I want to tell you about somebody who's lived in Rosa Parks' shadow. Rosa Louise McCauley would grow up to be a civil rights activist who refused to give up her seat on a bus, an action that launched the boycott that ended the segregated bus system in Montgomery, Alabama. She became known as the mother of the freedom movement. But when Rosa was 11, she was sent away from her family to live with relatives where she could attend a better school. That was such a complete and, and utter sort of shared responsibility that so many black parents had if they wanted their kids to get an education to graduate high school they had to do amazing things from sending them to live with relatives to moving to other cities to going to another country but coming back and doing the things they would do but the other person that i want to mention is a little girl named claudette colvin claudette colvin would grow up to be a nurse's aide who lived in the shadow of rosa parks but on march 2nd 1955 when she was just 15 years old and nine months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus, Claudette got on a bus and was soon told to give up her seat to a white man so he could sit down, and she refused. It was Claudette Colvin's lawsuit that actually ended segregated busing. That bus boycott that lasted literally a year and bankrupted the system and, and made everybody take seriously what this discrimination was doing, the two of them worked hand in hand to make that happen. So Claudette's picture is in the book too, which you can see when you get it. Um, so, so I'm hoping that not only is this something that's really interesting to read and, and inspirational to get a sense of things that you know, people didn't know about these men and women, but also is inspiring for kids and for adults who may have taken a wrong path and have decided, you know, when I was 15 and I was thinking about doing that, maybe that's what I should be doing. You are never too late to become someone different. So with that, I want to talk a little bit with Stephanie and answer your questions. And if you wind up wanting one more, I saved a couple. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rochelle, for spending your evening with us tonight and sharing these stories. And we'll make sure, we've got a bunch of other book club members, we'll make sure they get the video recap as well. But um, we wish you much success on getting this book in the hands of, of as many people as possible, and especially children. So um, anything we can do to help on that front, let us know. But um, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us tonight. We so appreciate that. And the only thing I would ask is that if you um, have your copy of the book, just you know, post on social media a picture saying you got yours. Um, and, and just make sure that people know about it. The more people know about it, the more excited they are. So I think the book, you know, is what people, I, I think it sells itself and, and, and people embrace it because they see what it is. But I really, really want this to become something that shows us the way to putting all of these types of stories in our history curriculum, in our history minds, so that our kids are learning a full history. It's, it's for everybody of every color because this changes how you're seen and it changes how you see yourself. So um, anybody who can do that, that would be great. And if you wanna know anything at all about what I'm doing, you can go to RochelleRiley.com where I put uh, updates and the book tour is there and people are calling every day. I just got two calls tonight for two more uh, of these chats and I, I call it the never ending <laughs> virtual that they live book tour. I'll be doing this until people decide, okay, I've had enough, so. Amazing. And Lauren said she's going to put a book in her little favorite library in front of a school. That's awesome. Oh, thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You guys were awesome. Thanks for the good questions and thanks for embracing the book and liking it. And uh, just, you know, we just got to work together to get to a place where we're all feeling better about each other and we can do it. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone. As always, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, if you're not part of the private Facebook group for the book club, feel free to join that through the writing room. Um, and coming up, um, if anyone's interested this Friday, we've got artist Brooklyn Lamb. She's going to be teaching a virtual drawing class at seven o'clock. Um, you can use a promo code 
rainforest, all caps, for $5 off. Um, and also on Monday, it's International Romance Readers Day. So we are hosting a Black Voices series featuring romance authors from Detroit. Um, we've got some pretty big names and some rising stars too. So that's coming up Monday at 7. Um, everything is at DetroitWritingRoom.com slash events, so you can check it out there. But um, next month, we have Judge Rosemarie Acolina. Um, she is the author of, oops, sorry, I put the wrong link in. I'll put it in the email later. But <laughs> Rosemarie is the author of All Rise, which is a crime novel. Um, it's pretty good, so um, make sure to leave some time to start digging into it, because it's like 400 some pages, I think. But um, thank you guys, enjoy the rest of your evening, stay safe, and I hope to see you all back soon. Thank you so much.